Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been to San Jose. You know, after I came here about 11 years ago. I was an interpreter for an academian event because uh, Joanna wanted me to come do it, so I did. <laughs> All right, so so we got us here, yeah. And I'm the international brand ambassador for the Ginseng Board. So a special thank you to Joanna and Five Branches, you know, and the Ginseng Board for taking the time to do this. And also all you students, the teachers, uh, mainstream medical practitioners, and the enthusiasts and general public who are not here today and maybe will view this online. I know Joanna planned to do this for the California credits and the national NCCAOM credits, so. We'll be seeing you guys later. And then Bob went into great detail, you know, about what the Ginseng Board is and uh, all the hard work that they do to keep the industry uh, afloat. So, you know, one of the biggest things is they don't set market prices, so you don't call up Bob and say, did you guys, you know, monopolize the prices on Ginseng? But they'll put you in touch with anything you need. So, a little introduction about myself. I lived in China for almost 20 years. I have three medical degrees there. I did it all in Mandarin. And uh, I, some people have done that. I've had people who come to did their master degree and they could barely get through and then they claimed I did it in Mandarin. I went for my undergraduate and I was really young and I worked really hard and I was really poor, so I worked really hard. I tried to, I didn't want to come home a failure because where I'm from, that's what they're going to remember. And I, I, do, I do the NCCAOM, you know, I have the Diplomat of Oriental Medicine. In our state, we get the title of Doctor of Oriental Medicine. I think it's just Wisconsin and Arizona that have this title. New Mexico. Yeah, our New Mexico, I think, I didn't know it was New Mexico or, I know it was one other place. But people abuse it in my state. People who don't have a doctor can say that. Everyone's on their car and they're a doctor of oriental medicine, not one of the doctors, or an internal medicine degree. So uh, I have worked for the Ginseng Board for many years in collaboration, maybe the last five, six, seven years now. And uh, they had come to me and said they wanted to do an event for, for this, and I knew Joanna. I hadn't seen her in a long time, and I reached out to her, and she was nice enough to call me back, and that's how we're here today. And I, after living in China for 20 years, you know, I, I have my own clinic and I do the VA community care and I am really busy. And let's go into some basics. So this seminar that we're doing here, I am aimed at uh, a crowd that isn't a master in this yet. So the idea is more for general public people, non-traditional practitioners, a more broader audience. So we all know, you know, the most important thing for the herb is their properties and taste, and Wisconsin ginseng is cold, so that's its property. It's sweet, slightly bitter, you know, that's its taste. You know, that is the, the harmonizing and moistening, you know, the tonifying, and slightly bitter, and we can drain it dry. So the key characteristics, what meridian it enters, you know, the heart, the lung, the kidney, you know, and how it guides its key characteristics, you know, it tonifies the chi and in, cools fire and deficiency, and promotes regeneration. Now, you would think that is a pretty broad clinical application. You know, how many diseases involve, you know, heat? But it's just so many. You know, there is a long list of possibilities for the type of research. So this seminar is try try to show you what other research is out there. So I'm starting with the real basics here and then moving into what research has already been done out there for the American ginseng and try to coax you guys into doing it. So you know, kind of see what other people are, have done. So, you know, we talk about our action and indications, you know, we got fire indications and deficiency, we have lung, you know, coughing, some chi and in problems, dryness, intestinal heat, a lot of stuff. And then there's a lot of classics that talk about tonifying lungs, 
you know, fatigue and irritability. There's even, you know, your your normal G. And forgive me if my nomenclature ain't the best. I did medical school in China. So my American nomenclature isn't, you know, the English isn't that bad. I did all my schooling in Mandarin. So some of my nomenclature, I think it's Gen Qi, you know, the normal Qi. I think that's what it's called in English. And they talk about one of the, one of these really old books talked about, you know, if you do, if you want this, the same tonification that you get from the Asian ginseng, you can get that from American ginseng without all the heat. So that's a big one for that. And then we talk about our clinical applications, you know, and this is what we're going to actually do in the clinic. You know? We got, we can nourish her in and tonify her tea, mind tranquilization, clearing deficient heat, promoting foods, and efficient fire and heat. So all of this leads into what kind of Treatments are we giving people that come in here? You've got respiratory issues, you know, you've got body heat issues, body fluid issues. So the clinical use for this plant is extremely broad compared to other plants, you know, and the efficacy is extremely high. You know, even if you would think about an integrated medical practice, you, there are a lot of documented research for different types of disease categories that Wisconsin ginseng has already demonstrated efficacy through clinical randomized trials to treat. You know, you got hypertension, you got cardiovascular, you know, you got your metabolism, cancer, fatigue, inflammation, autoimmune disorders. There is a wide berth of things that we can treat. But safety is always the key issue. Is it safe? And, you know, for the most part, inappropriate uses, just like any other herb got to be careful so if you ever you guys get into the idea is all you guys to become a researcher if some of any herb whatsoever and they're trying to some third party saying oh you got to have a higher dosage you got to have a higher dosage you know got to be careful I guess you know a lot of that means so good but we haven't had much toxicity you know we get aversion to colds and distension vomiting there's been reported drug rash asthma diarrhea you know you're gonna get a lot of Crashes and stuff like that. You know, cautions and contradictions. You know, you know, you got your your middle cold. You know, you don't want that. And fire from constraint. And you know, the middle burner yang deficiency. You kind of want to avoid that one. So let's talk about. So we all, a lot of us here are already professionals. You're licensed. So that's really not much interesting. You know, that was more for people who don't know anything. About you know about this plant. So now we want to talk about the research industry. So maybe some of you are thinking about doing research. Maybe you've published. Maybe you haven't. And maybe you want to. So we're gonna. I'm gonna try to give you some basic building blocks that you could use to do your own research. And one of the biggest obstacles is is that the Eastern nations like Korea, China, Singapore, Japan. Herbal medicine is already part of their conventional practice. We have not gotten there yet. So you say they're leading the industry in innovations. So hopefully we can work hard and that we can catch up to them and through our research that maybe one day herbal medicine be, does become part of conventional care. So that's the long-term aid. The other issue we have is most of the quality of the studies that are done you know, are not of a high enough impact to affect medic, conventional medical standard practice like USPSTF. And that's a big one we need to influence through study, through impact to get this care to become part of conventional medicine. So that's the biggest hurdle. And that's the current state of research. How do I conduct the study? Now, there's so many studies out there, this is not the one way to do it. I am just trying to give you some basic building blocks to kind of coax you guys into doing this. Uh, how can we conduct ALM studies when it's not part of standard conventional medical practice? This is indeed the largest barrier to practice, which will stop people almost dead in their tracks. Yes, we can do it. We can do it through collaboration partnerships. So. 
think you got to be a people person if you want to do this. So you're going to have to reach out and cooperate with a lot of people to do this. You should seek out a reputable oriental medicine institution like Five Branches. So this is probably a really good place if you think uh, you got a really good idea to study. This would probably be a really good place to come to. You'd probably want to study a really rep reputable herbal medicine decoction or a very reputable single herb, like for example, Wisconsin ginseng. It's right here in America. It's clean. It's a few staples for the herbal medicine category that is such a highly soft and powerful tonic that you're lucky to find, and it's right here in America. And the ginseng board would be more than happy to collaborate with you. All you gotta do is reach out to them. I'm sure they'd be happy to help. If you ever felt like publishing, and I know there's a publisher in all of you, deep down inside. So where do we connect? Where can we do these, these types of research as well? There's the a reputable non-traditional medical academic institution and the conventional medical institutions like a state university, a local hospital, a local clinic. You might be so inclined if you talk to a doctor at one of these clinics and said, hey, would you like to do a clinical trial or some research with me? You'd be surprised that they'd say, I'd be open to that. If you just went and reached out to them. Even the larger state universities and the hospitals might be a little more tricky. They go a little, a little more coaxing. You, you would where another avenue of resource would be, you know, really large clinics like larger chain clinics for the ALM. Maybe the American <laughs> Society of Acupuncturists. You know, that's a big national organization. I think, I think in our state they have a board for research. You know, and inside of their charter, so that might be another place to get research conducted. So these are the research. The, the, the kind of think about if you want to do a trial, where are the resources to go do this. So the need for research and investigation for AOM. We have to look at previous studies in order to move forward and find out where the flaws were. What can we do better? What did we learn from them and how can we improve? So first we have to confirm the findings of studies that might not have been big enough or statistically significant enough to have a real impact. Maybe redo a past study that was done before to strengthen the message. And maybe the lack of message might be the problem. So that's you fine tuning something that was already done. And you look at this publication and you can see the holes and say, hey, I think they would have had a much better message if I would have done this or I would have done that. So what are some possible aims that you really want to aim for? Not all the aims that are out there, but some. Your probably first aim is you're thinking larger sample size, more patients, more patients, more power, more evidence. And that's the kind of moves we need to make to move herbal medicine into conventional medicine. To innovate or enhance a previous study which means new modalities, new treatment angle, new treatments. Again, with the goal to become part of standard conventional medicine practice for certain diseases. Now, we all have our lane and some things that we know that we can treat well, and then there are some things that we can't. We all have a scope of practice. You know, we're not primary care physicians, so we've got to stay in our lane. So you highlight, uh, you know, Highlighting these previous standards, when you think of a study, here's one way to think about it. You say, hey, this treatment for, let's say cancer, for example, the, the treatment is so damaging on the body, you know, versus the efficacy, what you're getting for the results. And there is definitely a modality that I know that I want to research, that I'm almost sure that I'll have better clinical outcomes and less harmful adverse effects on patients. So that's another aim. So there's all kinds of different angles you go when you're thinking about doing research. So elements of pioneering. You gotta review what was done in the past to ask some questions. 
to make new modalities to enhance treatments that you've done. And we can't do it without you guys here. So this is the biggest thing. You guys are the mover and the driver. If this country is to ever produce more research that could move us into conventional medicine, it's coming from you guys, you know, all you students in here. So that should be all of our long-term goal. I know maybe some of you might be adverse to the idea of health insurance, but a lot of you guys in your clinical practice, you know, to survive, you're going to probably have to do it. And if herbal medicine, you want to do well in that as well, another big major factor would be conventional medicine accepts this treatment as necessary and the efficacy is there. So we should be striving to have our care become part of conventional medicine, our herbal medicine, because acupuncture already made it. So, not. so what are some additional elements? Because there's so many. Here's just a few. When you want to do your research, you build your understanding about the best research practices. So what that means is you go out and you go read a lot of papers. And you see what they're doing versus what they're doing and what were the best practices and you kind of got to filter it out what are the best practices and the only way you're going to do that is by doing a lot of work to find out what those are so no one can just tell you well what are they you're gonna have to go find out for yourself and they're always changing you have to keep abreast to new new best practices Consider patient safety and ethical concerns about your research efforts. So you shouldn't just be doing this because you want a grant or you want the money. So you should be considering the safety of the patient. So, you know, maybe some, you know, pharmaceutical company out there says, well, we want you to do 100 grams for your of whatever for this. And, and you know that's too much. You know? So that's a kind of an ethics issue and that would compromise maybe patient safety. So just for you to publish a paper or you know, be sponsored on a grant. So these, we, this is what we, I think a big red flag for our industry. You need to translate your findings into useful strategies for patients. So this is the most ideal reason you should be researching as I feel that I know that this herb or these Decoction of herbs will definitely lead to better patient outcomes. So I'm going to go study it because I know for the people that have come to my practice or my professor's practice or my school's practice that this works. And we want to try to get this part of conventional medicine. So that's how we translate useful findings into strategies and doing research all at the same time. So how can Wisconsin Jensen fit into complementary and integrative? medicine. So we have to find some examples of foundation biomedicine to integrate. So we think of Wisconsin Jensen's aspect of cold, the property aspect. It's similar to some of the effects that they have in bioscience on the central nervous system, like a calming effect, like cooling, you know, the tranquilizing the mind effect. And that comes from its biological effect. So there has been published research for RG1, uh, RG1 and RB1 that one is an inhibitor and one is more of a stimulator. So the ratio of the, the inhibitor is higher in American ginseng versus in the Asian ginseng. So that's where the calming effect. Now that's where you cross tie your traditional medicine and uh, integrated medicine and Again, that's not so simple. Well, just tell me how to do it. So you're going to have to go and do your own work and find out where, you know, where is the correlation between my traditional treatment and modern medical science. So you say, just give me the answer. That's not how research works. So you have to innovate. And you can do it by looking at research that was done before and coming up with your new rationale and hypothesis. So a big one, I want you all to be a researcher. Biostatics, the biostatistician, you cannot live without this guy. So unfortunately, if you want to do any research of any kind, the 
This guy's got to be involved. They'll teach you how to better track and interpret your data, your, your data, and you would want to collaborate with someone who's reputable. You know, most universities have them. There's people in the private sector as well. You know, they'll they'll help you develop methodologies for collecting your data. You know, your design studies and clinical trials to solve a specific problem or question, because you come to them and you say, I I know this treatment works really good. For this disease and he'll help you kind of map out you know the math behind here to get you into creating your own study they'll help you collect and analyze your data sets and they'll help you interpret your results and interpret and determine findings to help you present on your paper for publication so you say okay well where do i get the money for this <laughs> money don't grow on trees right well ginseng they call it the green gold but they had to wait five years to harvest it, so like nothing, nothing's free, right? The NIH will fund your study if you can uh, manage to write a decent application. I heard that for first-time grant writers, the bar is much lower than if you're not a first-time grant writer. So the likelihood that you will get a grant your first time is much higher than the second time you go for a grant. And if you look at this page, I just took this off here recently, you can see acupuncture needles, you know, you can see some massage there, you know, that Asian body work therapy is a patrina, you know, you got some yoga feedback here, and plants, so this looks like it's right up your alley. You know, they're almost inviting you to go do research. So you're wondering where the money comes from. Now there's other funding too, you could maybe have a wealthy donor, a pharmaceutical company. Your own money. So there's lots of ways to do it. But uh, patients do not pay for clinical trials. So, you know, there's ethics rules involved when we do a clinical trial, and that's one of them. They don't pay. So this is the one way to get that cash. Then we talk about the levels of evidence and research. This will give us a roadmap of where we want to go and just be cautious about interpreting these results. The top is the clinical practice guideline. So that's our end goal. We want to get herbal medicine into conventional medicine. You know, you have your meta-analysis, you know, that's a big review and that's very difficult to do. That's why it's near the top. So then you got your randomized clinical trials also very difficult to do and your cohort studies a little easier than that you know and then your control cases a lot easier and then you get to you know your your normal reviews and expert opinions and then you get to the laboratory the bench so we're going to talk about phytochemistry and pharm pharmacology, pharmacology of ginseng a little bit you know we know our there are so many ginsenicide groups that are involved and you're going to probably have to seek out someone to help you with this, like a microbiologist or someone who does phytochemistry for your research. So we know we got a couple main groups, the, the PPD and the PT, you know. There's also other scientific discoveries, you know, other, other chemicals that they're finding. They found more than 150 gen gensenicides, and that was when I did this, meta this research review of this a long time ago. That was already years ago. So there's probably even more now. As in Asia, they do a lot of research here versus we do very little because it's part of their conventional care. This was a publication I did quite a few years back already. And it was a mini review of American ginseng. So you'll see what is it, American ginseng, Wisconsin ginseng. So Wisconsin ginseng is American ginseng. It's just the American ginseng that's going on Wisconsin. But a lot of the research that's been done out there, most of them don't use the Wisconsin ginseng, like Bob told you. They only make 5 to 6% of all the American ginseng. So you don't get a whole lot of researchers coming to Wisconsin saying, hey, I want the best. You know, in fact, it's quite the opposite. So but they do. So the Wisconsin ginseng, through a literature review I published, I found, you know, it improves your health physical, emotional, and well-being, you know, they have ginsenicides that act on many systems of the body, central nervous, 
antioxidant, you know, we've got uh, anti-inflammatory as well. So when you look at all the different clinical efficacy, you know, cardiovascular, immune system, nervous system, metabolism, anti-cancer, you know, it is also very viable for people with chronic illness. And it's an adjunctive treatment. So this is something you gotta get used to. We are not the primary care. There's some things that we could very well could be primary care, but in a lot of these uh, extreme illnesses, you know, you're gonna have to rely a lot on modern medical science. So we're there to assist and improve outcomes. So we're waiting for further exploration. So there is so much done in this field. It's always changing. My data is already old by now. After I was maybe about four or five years ago, it's old by now. So we look at adverse effects that I tracked from clinical trials. Not so many. Stomach heaviness, you know, in a diabetic trial, not so much. Then for two Wisconsin, now these ones actually used Wisconsin ginseng. That was the Mayo Clinic trials, and they're about 10 years old. There was one, I think, in 13 and maybe 10. So, you know, that would be considered older data now, but it's the biggest study ever done in America. And they didn't find too much adverse effects, you know. Nothing statistically significant. A little bit of nausea, dizziness, headache, trouble falling asleep. My uh, teacher, when I was in med school in China, my uh, Western medicine teacher, she didn't like to take American ginseng because it gave her so much energy she couldn't sleep at night. So she would never take it. And uh, I learned a lot from her. Um, when we look at the other clinical trial done, only five toxicities. You know, that's not significant. It was one percent, so it's not significant. You know, same thing. And agitation, anxiety, nausea, vomiting. Not, not a whole lot. You know. Now we kind of move into different types of studies. This is the one that's more down your lane. If uh, you're going to have to compare these two for the retrospective and the prospective. So the retrospective one is you kind of go back and you can use a lot of stuff you do in the clinic. This is everyday practice that you use in the clinic. You can go back in time. All that data that you have from your patient records, and you can go in and you can make a publication with the work that you've done. So these are more pragmatic studies. They're more flexible. They're more real life practice ones. Then you want to go to your prospective one. A big difference. The prospective ones and the cohorts are very rigid and very difficult to do. They're usually done in very large facilities. And they are extremely rigid and strict. So for a lot of people who don't have such a large clinic, they have a smaller practice. But you want to publish. And I'm not just saying Wisconsin ginseng, maybe something that you really like to do. We're, we're hoping that you do do some Wisconsin ginseng publications, but this is, a, you know, the retrospective one is probably a big one for you guys. So if you get some time, you can look into that. Now we're going to look at some previous clinical research publications, you know, the effects on the nervous system, the effects on the cardiovascular, and metabolism, and the immune system. So you're thinking, okay, you got all these effects, right? Well, how does it, how does this even happen? So a lot of these clinical trials, they do oral indigestion. The reason why is they do the double blind studies. And you, when you do these types of trials, you can't tell them that, hey, this is ginseng, you know? You give them, you know, the real and the placebo, and that's why a lot of this is done orally. And they say, okay, you take this, well, then what does it do, you know? It metabolizes and absorbs into your blood. So you're going to have to, you're thinking, well, it's better through the, the decoction. Yes, it is. But unfortunately, for medical research purposes, it's going to be really hard for you to do a large scale trial decocting a whole lot of this on a randomized trial. So that's why the oral capsule is ideal for any research that you want to do for oriental medicine. But you think your sham acupuncture 
even very, very difficult to do a trial like that. Your patient's laying down, they can see it's not a real, so really hard to do sham acupuncture treatments, you know. That's the same thing with herbs, you're like, well, you know, the extract is another way, yeah, but, you know, it's just not so easy to do. But I'd like to see you guys innovate. So when we look at uh, the, uh, the effects on the central nervous system, you know, that was the example I gave, you know, and they suggest that it increases your concentration, eliminates fatigue, it enhances your working memory, and there are other clinical effects like insomnia, your irritability, memory decline and dementia. And most people haven't explored a lot about them, but there there is a small amount of publications, and that's where you guys come in. So you might be very interested in one of these fields. So this might be the field you're really interested in. So this is kind of a go about doing it. So we know that ginsenocides, they they have the neuroprotective effects. At least the publications speak to it. And we think that it probably doesn't greatly benefit you cognitively, but it's probably more effective for neuroprotective people with chronic trauma or deficient populations. So that's what the current, or at least what was current a while ago, so it was a while since I did my review, but this could be a place where you find your, yourself, you know, where, where am I going to come to? So here's a clinical trial that was done. It was randomized, they had 52 people, and they tested their working memory, and their results showed that uh, there was a significant, you know, statistical significance for the results in short-term memory. And they're thinking, you know, the, the, that the RG1 was responsible, you know, and for the stimulation and the RB1, both of them working in harmony, they think that not only that helped, but that it could also do, if they could tweak with these different ginseng levels, that they could do all kinds of other enhancements and treatments. So that's kind of what they hinted at after the research. But they showed that it did work for their working memory, at least based on the trial that they did. So that means this trial worked, but nobody went and did a bigger one. You know, so that's kind of where you guys come in. Like, hey, oh, I go and you know try a better. You read their publication and say, hey, I think they didn't do that that great. You know, you look at that and say, hey, I, I think I could do something a little different. And then we look at the cardiovascular system. So there's a lot of stuff that has been published in regards to this. You know that. You can regulate your blood pressure, all kinds of stuff, you know, for hypertension, heart disease, heart failure, you know, all kinds of stuff that they got in here. So heart disease seems to be influenced by probably promoting the blood vitality, you know, you're 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 reducing the clotability and and inhibiting plate, the platelet aggregation. So this is and the Arthrosclerosis, you know, and, and promoting red blood cell growth, you know. So this is big stuff. And this might be where you study, you know. When I was in China, we all were sent to different apart departments in the hospital for internal medicine. Your cardiovascular, you know, pulmonary. So I went to rheumatology. So this is when, when I did my doctorate for, for uh, I did two acupuncture, an undergraduate in acupuncture, and a master's degree in acupuncture. And then for my doctorate, I did internal medicine, and I went to rheumatology. So these aren't really my specialties, but I studied a lot about, I had to learn, I did a clinical trial in, in university, I did two of them, but the last one I did was, it would have been really big if COVID hadn't come, but I still got some people through, unfortunately. But, you get to learn a lot about other departments, but you kind of specialize in one area in the end. So you know a little bit about everything, or not a lot, and then you kind of focus on what, what you're interested in and what you feel you're good at. So here's one study they did for the cardiovascular system. They had 64 patients, so it was pretty good. And it showed it improved hypertension and arteral stiffness. So that's really good. 
And that was the results of their study. You know, they're thinking it was the antioxidant function, you know, that, that, that stopped the damage. But again, that's what they think, that's not what they know. So that's what their, their rationale that they went through. Yes, ma'am. I'm curious, if it's too far afield, don't answer. But how does this differ from how a statin works? Um, I think the statin medications are probably a lot stronger, ma'am. Stronger? Yeah. These are probably, efficacy means within 5%. So there was a, that's the minimum. <laughs> so without going in and ripping out this paper and looking at exactly what the stats were, but they, it was statistically significant, so they published. But you know, that might just be a minor change. But I mean, it was natural. So you know, you're thinking side effects, right? You know, this unreported really, at least not for this one, there were some people with a tummy ache. I mean, that's basically all you're getting for this. Oh, so I'm almost done. So then, you know, diabetes, so my mother's diabetic, so this one's close to my heart. My grandmother was diabetic. And, you know, it's been shown to reduce blood sugar and regulate insulin secretion and promote glucose metabolism, fat metabolism. And they think that that came from compound K and the RB1. So that's where they're thinking it's coming from. But people are still studying. I knew professors that were working on this when I was a giant. They were studying this. So they had put, there was a study with 39 participants, and it showed their A1C and lipid concentration. You know, it worked. It decreased it. Statistically significant, but then again, you say, did it change? Did it drop them down 100%? Probably not. I wouldn't know. I'd have to go rip out this publication and look at it. So they think that it was the anti-diabetic effects caused by the genocides from RB1 and RB the RB2 and the RH2 and compound K. So that was their basic rationale of uh, mechanisms of action. And again, waiting for you guys to explore more, do more. So then the immunity system, they think, you know, we do bone marrow protein synthesis, you know, inhibit the growth of cancer cells. You know, it's, it's effective in resisting cancer. And I, you know, I don't, when I was in China right before the pandemic came, there was a professor of mine. He had uh, gotten some Wisconsin ginseng from the distributor, Tiger Lee, in China. He came back with the results. I mean, I can't say what they are, because it's his discovery, but significant for cancer. Not exactly what they were. He wanted more. He calls me. I was in America. It's like I'm coming to China next month. It was during, it was during the pandemic. I left. And I was like, I'm coming back in a month. He said, I want more. <laughs> he showed me, showed me the results. And I've been kind of in and out of China since the pandemic started. I was working in the hospital when it broke up. It kind of brought me back here, back home. So, lots of. Uh, Immunity systems, they believe that these genocides affect, you know, specific immune, cellular immunity, hormone immunity. There's all kinds of stuff in here. Okay, so we're just, here's, here's maybe something you can think about tying your ALM, you know, for, for immune function. You know, you try to focus on, on your UN chi, you know, the, your original chi, and you want to drive out the pathogenic factors, you know. Regulating lung, spleen, and kidney. But that, yes, ma'am. So, do you know of any, based on this last one, um, <laughs> anyone doing research with um, American ginseng and long COVID? On COVID? I actually they did do some work on COVID. <laughs> and they found long COVID. Not long COVID. No, just short acute phase. They used it for the acute phase. I think it was like stage three or like the beginning, like post infection. I think maybe week two or three. So, but it wasn't just a single herb decoction. You know, American ginseng was one of the herbs of it. It was the Guangdong, I think, Food and Drug Administration, actually. So that's, uh, uh, yeah. So I only know of that one for COVID. 
but COVID's gone now. So, and we're going to keep We have long COVID <laughs> forever. Well, just like we have flu now. So, it's here with us. We're, we're going to live with it. We have no choice. So, you think of the immunity system. So, there were 40 case patients who did radiation. Yeah, they went and found that they, it had, you know, radioprotective properties. So this is really impressive. It's it's old, but I mean that is really great. You know, you know they they, they inhibited some some bad parts of your immunity system. They turned up the good parts. You know, like they increase your your T your T helper cells. You know. This is a really amazing study, and I hope somebody else comes and does one just like this. And then we have the most famous study in Wisconsin. There's two of them. They were cancer fatigue. These are really big numbers. So 175 and then 261. So this is big. And both the studies indicated clinical significance at 200 grams a day for eight weeks. And if I look back on here, it was like 99%. So this, they were so sure of their findings. It was just after eight weeks. So this, these were big. And this was done by the Mayo Clinic, you know. They didn't publish in Nature, but, you know, because it's kind of hard for, you know, this topic isn't what would be considered high impact. You know, cancer fatigue. Yes, ma'am. Was it injection or just oral? Oral, because the injection, it would be hard to find out 200 people to agree to an experimental injection. So when you do clinical trials, this is going to be a big thing that you might have an idea that, you know, if we did this by injection, it's going to work way better. It probably does. More than likely it does. But you have to think about patients. A lot of patients are going to say, no way, Jose, I'm not getting an injection. So. It's the same thing when you do pills and tablets. I remember telling my professor, you know, we got to do this many grams a day. And he's like, really, we got to do a bunch of small pills. There's no way they're taking these horse tablets, you know, they're, they're just not going to take them. So, and he was pretty adamant about it. And I was young and inexperienced, and he turned out to be completely right about, about that. And they had found that, you know, for uh, cancer fatigue, that they were recommending it. I am not sure why this had, I think, enough impact to move guidelines, and I'm not sure why it didn't. So this was, the thing you were missing was stage, a really big stage three. So this was two, you need like a thousand people. So you see they kind of stopped short of the finish line here, right? But they did really big studies, but huge. This is Wisconsin Jensen too. Sure, go ahead. Well, a couple studies ago, you it showed that ginseng didn't help. What was the difference between this study and the previous one? You said for cancer-related fatigue, there was no uh, significant. Maybe I misspoke, but okay, significant. All anything I put in here was was significant. Yeah, I lost my English for a living in China for twenty years. And, <laughs> you know, you didn't have to let me slide. My English ain't the best anymore. I, I spent almost more days in China than I did in America. So anything that these studies, the reason I, I show them is because they were randomized clinical trials. So all the ones I put up here, and they were all kind of major categories that you'll see for American ginseng, like, oh, if, you know, the cardiovascular system, the immune system, where did they get this data from? You know, so these are the clinical trials that went off of the bench. That's the laboratory data or the review, the reviews of the laboratory data. Then they went and did a trial. So. One day, I'm hoping that you guys decide to do that. Like, okay, here's kind of the road, the roadmap. You want to do a, a study, you're probably going to have to review it first, or go see somebody else's review. More than likely, do one of your own, and then yes, ma'am. I think the articles are in NIH. Yep. These are already pretty old. That was done, and the last one was 2013, and I think the first one was 2010. We reached out to Mayo Clinic last year. And we got in touch with the Wisconsin, uh, the University of Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and the director of outreach for research. 
she was an immigrant from China and she liked it. She said, yeah, we're going to do this. We didn't hear from her for a while. You know, I had just opened my practice, you know, I'm just waiting for, I don't know, it to come up, come up. And then one day the board was like, hey, Eric, where is that? I go, I go message her. She had left her post or something and a new person was in there. And they said, we cannot do re clinical research with the Mayo Clinic in Wisconsin. You know, I got back. So we, we try to do a Mayo Clinic study. So, you know, we try to reach out to big institutions, but it's not like, oh, well, I'm just a clinic. Well, we could, I'm sure the Jensen Board would be more than happy to help you with your study. All you'd have to do is just reach out to them. And then this was uh, a study that I published. I did a randomized clinical trial for rheumatoid arthritis patients. You know, I did the associated fatigue, but what we really looked at, the other secondary uh, biomarkers we looked at was the inflammation properties. Because if any, any of you know, if you ever worked in rheumatology, all of these diseases are uncurable at the moment. And they don't know the epidemiology, which means they don't know how it got there, how to get rid of it. So I thought that this might be a nice angle for me to study journal medicine, try to help people you know, be cured and learn more about pain. You know, we all treat pain, right? You know, the, it's, uh, yeah, and the indication, you know, so when we looked at, you know, the, the bioscience, the RG1, and RB1 anti-inflammatory properties. You know, the RB1, that'll even reduce <coughs> the destruction of cartilage, the TNF, TNFA expression, very significant for rheumatoid arthritis patients. And they even found that the compound K inhibited or decreased at least during uh, 